In his book, Brightest and Best, my friend Sam Portero writes this in his homily for the Feast of Blessed James de Coven. Twice elected and twice denied the episcopate, James de Coven refused to trade his convictions for a consecration. At issue was de Coven's defense of ritualism, a contentious matter in 19th century Anglicanism. De Coven clearly defended not the externals of liturgy, but the devotion they symbolized. Nevertheless, he lost his argument and was denied the episcopate to which he had been duly elected. Tragically, writes Sam, tragically, both those who elected him and those who rejected him were probably right to do so. Sam points out how tenacious de Coven could be about his convictions. Once he had taken a stand on something like the rightness of candles on the altar or reverencing the Blessed Sacrament, there was no dissuading him. Granted, he argued eloquently that the point of such things was not the things in and of themselves. De Coven stood firm that it was the thing itself, the reality of the presence of the Lord to which they pointed. That is what was at stake in the recovery of these ritual details. He believed that dearly. It was his passionate defense of things and gestures that spoke of the sacramental presence of the living Christ that fueled his election as bishop, and it was the immovable insistence about these same matters that fueled the church's unwillingness to confirm that election. It was obvious that James de Coven would gladly bend before the altar. It was not quite as clear that he could be pliable enough to recognize the presence of the Lord who sometimes comes to us in ways that challenge our deepest convictions. The presence of the dying and rising Lord is not confined merely to the bread and wine of the Eucharist. Jesus Christ is first and foremost present in the lives of the members of his body, made so in holy baptism. That messy, complicated, sometimes contentious reality we call church. I always say the church would be a great place if it weren't for people. <laughs> And to preside in that messy reality we call church. To preside in it, to be called into its leadership, to be entrusted with the care of God's people demands a certain pliability. Clergy in the room, hello. A certain pliability is necessary, rooted in Christ, to be sure. Rooted in Christ, whose spirit working in and through us all is leading us always deeper and deeper into the fullness of truth. As Paul writes to Timothy, the only absolute certainty we dare to claim is our own participation in the Paschal mystery, our union with Jesus in his death and his resurrection. And everything else must bow to that reality. And we must continually cultivate awareness of the perpetual danger that words and ideas, even the most cherished doctrines, that they might take the place of our participation in the very life of God. Wrangling over words is something the church is very good at. Holding silence together before the mystery of God, not always so much. I believe James de Coven knew all of that in his heart. And at the end of the day, all his arguments, all of his convictions, all of his, the practices he insisted on, they were all aimed at that speechless adoration of the God who loves us beyond imagining. De Coven longed for a church that was lost in wonder, love, and praise. Wrangling over the means to that holy silence being right about them, winning the argument, he didn't cling to any of it in the final analysis. He told us so. 
He told us so in that famous speech to the General Convention in 1874, quite possibly the most eloquent speech ever to have been delivered before the General Convention of the Episcopal Church, his passionate defense of rituals that caused a whole lot of wrangling then, and which are now absolutely commonplace in our church. He said this to Coven. You may take away from us, if you will, every external ceremony. You may take away altars and super altars and lights and incense and vestments. You may take away every possible ceremony and you may command us to celebrate at the altar without any external symbolism whatsoever. You may give us the most barren of all observances and we will submit to you. If this church commands us to have no ceremonies, we will obey. But, but, to adore Christ's person in his sacrament, that is the inalienable privilege of every Christian and Catholic heart. How we do it, the way we do it, the ceremonies with which we do it are utterly, utterly indifferent. It is the thing itself we plead for. We can call James de Coven blessed because of his clarity about just that. He accepted the decisions of the church about his vocation with all of the hurt and disappointment and even anger that it must have caused him. He accepted it and instead of bitterness, he gave himself completely to the worship of God and the service of God's people as pastor and teacher. Not unlike the Apostle Paul, but the standards of his day, de Coven was never a great success. Projects failed to flourish. Struggles were the order of his day. The seeds he scattered right here were indeed small ones. But those seeds, those seeds he planted in hearts across the church, and in this very place, those mustard seeds have sprouted. And they have grown. And they have borne so much fruit. More than he could ever have imagined. James de Coven is a saint, not because he succeeded, but because he was faithful to the Lord who called him and equipped him and claimed him as his own. So, dear friends, in the communion of saints, may the prayers of James de Coven surround us this day. And may his example inspire us and continue to show us the way to Jesus.